so um, over the last bunch of years, the two of you have been um, important voices in the overall global Jewish conversation. So we're looking forward to an amazing uh, um, conversation here tonight. Don't get their hopes up. Everyone's <laughs> going to be disappointed. Going with um, low expectations. I find that hard to believe. Anyway, so um, your new book um, uh, has really um, captured the imagination of, of the Jewish people as we look back and as we look forward. And, and, and while we want to ta spend time talking um, about um, this wonderful text, um, we also want to talk about some of the, um, not just some of the heroes that you uh, uncover, but also some of the challenges they face that really are at the underpinnings of the uh, society um, that they were um, uh, um, important in playing a role of giving birth to. So um, first, let's just let's let's um, let's begin with you, Mati. Um, why did you write the book? The original draw for me was that this is a good spy story, and I think that, uh, like many people, I find good spy stories irresistible stories of double identity and subterfuge and sabotage and things like that. And as a journalist, I'm always looking, first of all, for a good story that can grab people's attention, and, but that's not enough. It's not enough to have a good story. It needs to be a good story that says something important about my beat, which is the state of Israel and, and the society in Israel. So I moved to Israel in 1995 from Toronto. I grew up in Toronto and moved to Israel when I was 17, intending to be there for one year. And that was 24 years ago, um, and I'm still there. Um, but when I came into the country, I came with a set of very simple stories, uh, most of them European stories. So I had a story about Theodore Herzl and, and pogroms in Europe and socialism and the kibbutz idea and the Shoah, of course, that was all very important. And that's what I knew when I went to Israel. And I found very quickly that those stories do not explain the, the country that I live in. And there are several reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is that half of the Jewish population of Israel, so if we set aside for a moment the one-fifth of Israel's citizens who are Arab Muslims, and we take the Jewish majority, half of the Jewish majority in Israel comes from the Islamic world. They're native to the Islamic world. And they have very little to do with pogroms in Europe and the kibbutz idea and, and the Holocaust. And yet the stories that we tell about Israel don't really address that. So we have a story about the country and then you have the actual country that you see on the street. You have a cuisine that's shaped by the Middle East, pop music. If you turn on a radio station in Israel, you're gonna hear Middle Eastern pop music. That's the dominant pop form in Israel. Our politics are very Middle Eastern. Our Judaism is very Middle Eastern. And that makes sense if you live in the society, but it's not reflected in the stories about the society. So more and more, I've been looking for stories that address that. We need new stories. We need better stories about the country. The old stories are great. The stories about David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Dayan and Golda Meir, and those are all fantastic stories, but they don't explain the country. So we need news stories. So here I had a story that was both a good spy story about double identity, and it was a story that got at the secret identity of the country that I live in, and its secret identity is basically that it's a Middle Eastern country uh, pretending to be a European country, and that's what this story does. And I said, you know what, that, that story is worth a couple years of my time. Whether it actually was, I'll let you guys judge. <laughs> um, so, um, not to put you on the spot, but I guess that's what I'm here to do. Um, what did you think of the book? What was your impression of this uh, untold, unheralded um, spy tale? Be completely honest, Micha. <laughs> don't, don't feel uncomfortable. Now's the time for a really scathing review of the book. All right, do I take the mic? <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for this conversation. Sure. It's really a privilege uh, to be here. Um, I absolutely love the book, and I'm so grateful that you spent those years uh, really working on it. Uh, beyond being an amazing human interest story, uh, like Matti said, I was so captivated uh, to read a book written in English about Zionism, about Israel, whose central characters were Jews from the Middle East, Jews from the Islamic world, what some might call Mizrahim in Israel today. Um, I'm Argentinian. I grew up in a family that has a Syrian, Moroccan, and Spanish roots. By marriage, I, uh, I inherited another uh, stories of families from Egypt, um, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, and honestly, for much of my life, I had this bifurcated existence in which I had my uh, Sephardic community and, and our uh, prayers, what you might call davening, and our food. Uh, and then there was the Jewish public square in which we spoke about Zionism and Israel, and most of the stories there and the heroes and the heroines uh, were Ashkenazi Jews, which never really bothered me 
uh, until I, I got older. But reading, reading your book, Mati, it actually felt like an intensely personal and even emotional experience. Like suddenly it's like reading about young men uh, who come from the, the cities that my great-grandparents came from. And it was something incredibly, incredibly special uh, and redemptive about this experience. And I really thank you so much for this. Uh, and I want to I wanna say something else, Mati. I think that it is to your credit uh, that this is, I think, the first non-academic book in English about Zionism and Israel that centers Mizrahi Jews. But I also think that this book needs to lead us, the American Jewish community, to ask a question as to why it's taken so long for this story to really arrive to us. So um, it is an amazing spy tale. And um, I can uh, say to you, um, I really could not put it down. Is there a story in, in, the, in, in, uh, in your research or in writing the book that moved you um, most? Actually, there are a couple that I have, but I'm really curious in terms of, as the author, um, were there episodes in the book that really moved you? The four, the four main characters in this story are kids, Jewish kids from Arab countries who kind of end up in British Mandate Palestine in the 40s. They're, they're basically kids. They're, they're barely out of their teens. Some of them are still in their teens. And they're also kind of street kids, some of them. They're in the country without their parents. Isaac Shoshan, who's one of the four and the only one who's still alive, he uh, uh, found himself selling green peppers from a crate in the Carmel Market in Tel Aviv. He was a very poor kid from Aleppo. He grew up in the alleys of Aleppo. He was the son of a janitor, and he, uh, he ends up in this kind of very exciting new Jewish society before the founding of the state, but he's marginal because nine out of every 10 Jews in pre-state Palestine was uh, Ashkenazi, was European, mainly East European in, in origin. And um, he's picked up by a counselor from one of the Zionist youth movements and brought to a kibbutz. And on the kibbutz, he's spotted by recruiters for this very small amateur uh, intelligence operation that is called the Arab section, Hamachlaka Aravit. And that's the, the operation at the center of the story. It's a small unit that belongs to the Palmach, which is the elite of the pre-state uh, mil Jewish military underground. Uh, just so we understand what we're talking about, but there are uh, many escapades in the book. Some of them are kind of comic in, in nature. Some of them are tragic comic. Uh, one of them that just stood out in my mind because I was so surprised that I had never heard of it before I researched this book. Have you ever heard the story of Hitler's yacht? So it was famous for a while, but no one has ever heard of it now. In the fall of 1948, um, Hitler's yacht. I'm going to tell you the very short version of this story. <laughs> These spies, after many adventures, are running what is Israel's first intelligence station in Beirut, which is the capital of Lebanon. And this is eventually the nucleus of the Mossad, but they don't know it, and it's completely ad hoc and seat of the pants, and they barely know what they're doing. And that fall, a few months into the lifespan of the state of Israel, a small Nazi warship shows up in the port of Beirut. This is three years after the Second World War. And the Israelis, as they now call themselves, they've been Israelis for about five months. Uh, before that, they were just Jews. They realize that this small warship is actually none other than a Viso grill which is a ship built specifically for Adolf Hitler, Hitler by the Nazi regime in Hamburg in the 30s. It was the ship that he was supposed to sail up the Thames to accept the British surrender when they conquered Great Britain. And that doesn't happen, um, as most of you know. And um, the ship is, disappears in, after the war and resurfaces in Beirut. And the, the Israelis put into, uh, into motion the country's first complex sabotage operation beyond its borders. So Israel becomes famous for this stuff later on. And we all know the stories of the Mossad and the mystique of, the, of Israeli intelligence. And, um, but this, none of this had happened yet. They'd never done anything like this before. They, they decided they absolutely must sink this ship. And they... Uh, uh, take an aerial photograph of the ship and they land a frogman in Beirut with magnetic mines and they, they, uh, they risk people's lives and they put a lot of effort into sinking the ship and there are two things going on in this story. One, and it's very representative I think of these spies and of, and of uh, these, these stories in general, there are two levels here, at least two. The Israelis uh, think that this ship, which is a small warship by World War II standards but a pretty powerful weapon by the standards of the Eastern Mediterranean in 1948, they're afraid that it's going to be given to the Egyptian Navy and used against the Israeli Navy in the independence war, which is still going on. And the Israeli Navy in the fall of 1948 is like 
the state of Israel, it's just wishful thinking. It doesn't really exist. Just like Israeli intelligence, it's kind of a figment of their imagination. There is no real Israeli navy. Um, so they're worried about this ship and they're gonna sink it. But the real reason, it's quite clear if you read the documents, is that they wanna sink Adolf Hitler's yacht. They want a kind of posthumous revenge. They wanna, they wanna strike a symbolic blow, um, and they're willing to expand a lot of effort to do it. And I won't give away exactly what happens, but things don't go exactly according to plan, <laughs> as is the case in many of their stories. And the ship is put out of commission, but not sunk. And just to make a very long story short, the only remnant of that ship that I know of is the toilet, Hitler's toilet. <laughs> and if you Google it, you will find that Hitler's toilet eventually ends up in Florence, New Jersey, <laughs> the toilet from the Aviso Grill. There's a few things that happen in the middle, um, but maybe I'll just tell um, a few, uh, just a, that's kind of a, a comic uh, escapade from the book, but um, another one of the spies, another one of my four main characters is a, is a man named Yakuba Cohen, who is a Jew. He's actually of Persian extraction, but he's born and raised in Jerusalem, and he speaks Arabic because he grows up with Arab Muslims and with Jews who are Arabic speakers. So he speaks fluent Arabic, and he is one of the spies from the Arab section, and he is sent in early 1948 to Syria, before the borders have been cut, so you can still cross the border. And he ends up with, a, with another one of the spies in Damascus, Syria. And he goes to the market in Damascus, and he decides that he wants to buy a set of copper coffee dishes, which you might have seen if you've been around the Middle East, kind of a coffee set, a pot and some cups. And he goes to a merchant in the market, bargains with the merchant. The merchant has one set, and Yakuba wants two, so he can bring one back to his, uh, to his friends. And the merchant says, okay, uh, come home with me. Now, Yakuba is posing as a Muslim from Palestine. Uh, his name's Jamil. That's his cover name. And as they walk home with this merchant, they're bragging. He and the other spy, they're both posing as fighters from, on the Arab side in Palestine, and they're bragging to this merchant about their victories in the war and what they're going to do to the Jews in Palestine, and they're playing it up. They're playing up their, their characters, and the merchant is kind of quiet. He doesn't say much. This is a Syrian guy, and they get to the house, and it's Friday afternoon, and Yakuba smells something, and he says, this is, this is Jewish food. This is Shabbat food. And his partner, another one of the spies named Shimon, he says, no, no, it's just Syrian food. You know, this is the, you're, you're imagining it. And they're in the merchant's house, and the merchant goes downstairs to get another one of these sets of coffee utensils, and Yakuba looks up at the ceiling, and there's a light fixture, a copper light fixture, and on the fixture it says, Zion, in Hebrew, Zion. And Yakuba realizes that he, you know, he has a dagger in his belt, and he's been bragging about what they're going to do to the Jewish population in Palestine once they win the war, and... This guy is, is Jew, like them, and they're playing a double identity game, and the merchant is also not being, <laughs> it's not clear who he is, and Yakuba tells this story. Uh, Yakuba's a very tough guy, he's a courageous guy, he's kind of uh, a, a great storyteller and someone who went on to a, a very storied career in the Mossad, and he's telling the story in an oral recollection 50 years later in the 1990s. And in the transcript that I have, the person who was recording the testimony says that Yakuba tells this story and he gets to the part where he realizes where he is and what he's been saying and he realizes his connection to this man and he realizes that he can't reveal it. He can't tell the man who he is. And the, the, the person writing the testimony down says he can't continue speaking. He's so choked up about this 50 years later that he can't continue speaking. And both of those stories are indicative of the adventures of the Arab section, I think. So one of the things that comes up in the book is um, the term Mizrahi. Um, and um, when I grew up, you, there was, you know, the, there were uh, a Svardim. So, um, Michal, what's the difference? Uh, okay, so I'm going to, we had all the really fun stories. Now I'm going to go into like an academic lecture. Uh, just kidding. Uh, so Mizrahim is actually a social category that emerged in Israel. Uh, before a lot of these Jews from the Islamic world arrived to Israel, they were Jews from Syria. They were Khalavi Jews, Shami Jews from Aleppo, from Damascus, Egyptian Jews. They tended to identify with a more like local identity based on their city of origin, although they might say that they belong to communities that keep Sephardic halacha or follow Sephardic rabbis. Uh, eventually, when we had like massive immigration, hundreds of thousands of Jews who arrived to Israel, um, the, the Ashkenazim who were there began actually calling them by Edot Amizrach. Edot Amizrach means the, the communities of the East. 
that term was a little bit not so flattering because if you assume that the West is enlightened and is progressive and is modern and is good, then the East is not all those things. Uh, and that the Mizrach eventually became called Mizrahim, and that's a term that Mizrahim eventually appropriated to talk about themselves. But Mizrahiyot and Mizrahim are really an Israeli social creation that developed there, um, and sometimes it overlaps with the category of Sephardim. So some Mizrahim would also be Sephardim, uh, or especially if you have Haredi, ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel, they might feel more comfortable with talking of themselves as Sephardic Jews, because Sephardi is a more uh, traditional religious term than say Mizrahi Jews. Uh, I'll just add here uh, that some people use the term Mizrahi and they assume that all Jews from the Islamic world or Arab lands can be called Mizrahim. I would argue that, uh, for example, certain American communities from the Middle East who didn't go through Israel, they continue calling themselves Sephardic and they don't necessarily all use the term Mizrahi. So to me, it's actually important to uh, accentuate and emphasize the Israeli character of the, of the category of Mizrahiyut, particularly, and I think we're going to get into this, because you know, Mizrahim in Israel experienced a pretty uh, heavy discrimination in the early decades of the state. So part of what it means to be a Mizrahi in Israel is to have that history, the history of having escaped the Arab world, having found refuge in Israel, and also having had experienced uh, difficulties uh, there as well. The, the, the parts of the book, by the way, Matty, that really touched me the, the most, I mean, everything touched me, but uh, it was actually back in, in Israel, uh, back then in Palestine, the land of Israel, uh, in which the, the spies tell of different interactions uh, they would have with, the, with their Ashkenazi Palmach uh, friends. And I think um, Gamliel, I think, is the one who speaks about, uh, they used to have this beautiful um, like bonfires at night, uh, and, and the dawn, the, the, the Arab section would have these bonfires that kind of became famous for Ashkenazim to come and watch. And some of them, uh, some of the people from the Arab section enjoyed that, and some of them felt like they became this like exotic foreign uh, creatures who made coffee in a very special way, uh, and who were now, you know, being watched as this, you know, not exactly Israeli or, or Tsarim sort of. Uh, of being so, so I found that really uh, moving because even as these young men were willing to risk their lives uh, and really do everything for to try to have their new state, they were also struggling uh, not only with multiple identities as spies, but what does it mean to be a Jew from from an Arab context in a country that doesn't fully understand what that means and doesn't fully recognize that as part of the of the beginning of the state. You know, there was. Um there was a, uh, that part of the book really moved me as well. You know, my first memory of my grandmother from Lithuania, and I know that's not the topic of, uh, that that's another book. My grandmother was from, from uh, Lithuania, and it, the, one of the, my first memories was her explaining that we weren't Lithuanians, that we were Jews. And um, it was really, it, it, I, was, oh, I was very, very young at the time, but reading, reading your book, I wonder what it was like for the Jews of the Arab lands to, um, what was their identity? How did, they, how did they square that? How did they put that together, being from a place, by the way, for thousands of years? And um, at the same time, and just uh, sort of like my family story, not being of that place. Uh, Michal mentioned Gamliel, and I think he's a good example of exactly that. So Gamliel Cohen is a very young man who grows up in the Jewish community of, of Damascus. And his name is Jamil Cohen. That's his name. It's an Arabic name because the Jews of the Arab world had Arabic names. And he runs away from Damascus because he wants to be part of this new Jewish society. And this is in the early 1940s. And he wants to be what today we would call Israeli, but wasn't called Israeli at the time. He wanted to be a new Jew. He wanted to be a chalutz. That's what he wanted. He didn't want to be a Jew from the Arab world. He understood, I think, in a very kind of prescient way that the Jews had no future in the Arab world. And he had to get out. So he runs away to this new, it's not, a, it's not a state yet, it's a project in Palestine, which is right next to Syria. I mean, you can walk there. So it's not like it is for European Jews, it's not like beyond the mountains, it's just you know across the, <laughs> across the road. And he goes and he joins a kibbutz. And on the kibbutz he finds something interesting, which is that he can't assimilate. He, they won't, 
the kibbutzniki are of uh, European, mainly East European origin, and, and Gamliel just, who is still Jamil, he, he's, he's just strange. He speaks Arabic. He seems like an Arab, and his name is Jamil. So he tries to solve this problem by using his Hebrew name. So now he calls himself Gamliel, which is a Hebrew name, but it doesn't quite solve the problem, and he can't quite get in. He's too different. And just as he's trying and failing to get into this incredibly compelling new society, a recruiter arrives from the Arab section. And what the Arab section is looking for is people who can pass using Arab identities on the other side of enemy lines. And the recruiter spots this kid, Gamli El Cohen, but he doesn't want Gamli El Cohen. He wants Jamil, the, the identity that he's trying to escape in order to break into this new society. And it's precisely the thing that's preventing his assimilation that becomes useful to the holy of holies of the, of the Jews in Palestine at the time, which is the Palmach. So the thing that is making his life hard ends up being his ticket into this new society. So Gamliel Cohen, who is now back to being Jamil, gets drawn into the Arab section. He's given a third identity. Now he's called Yusuf El Hamed and he is a Palestinian Muslim. And under that identity, he's sent back into the Arab world as a spy, and he goes back to the Arab world, which is, of course, where he's from. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on in, in these stories, and Gamliel, more than the other three, uh, is really aware of his position in Jewish society. So he's both very sensitive to politics on the Arab side, because that's his job as a spy, but he's also very sensitive to politics on the Jewish side, and he understands that he's being condescended to. He's smart enough to know that he's being treated with disdain, but it never undermines his commitment to the project. He's a Zionist. He believes in the cause. He's willing to die for the cause. Some of these guys die for the cause. Um, and that's their very interesting place. And that, I think, makes them very interesting and, and good heroes for 2019, the complicated heroes. So um, I think that's a perfect um, bridge to um, one of the hardest parts of the book to read, which is the original name of the unit. And maybe. Um, I would love to, uh, maybe you can explain how the unit was originally called. And um, even back in the 1940s, they realized it might not be the way to go. Um, and then uh, I'd love to hear your response to that, Michal. Sure. The, the uh, portion of the Jewish population in Palestine in the 40s that is Middle Eastern is very small. So, you know, today it's half, but the wave of immigration comes post-1948. In the 40s, it's a trickle. There are some Jews who are native to the land of Israel from places like Jerusalem, Hebron, um, old communities that speak Arabic. And there's a trickle of Jews who've come from Yemen, who've come from Syria, um, but they're, they're marginal. And it's accepted at the time to call them, and it's hard to gauge the, how much humor there is in this, but they're called, in, a, in, like, in colloquially, colloquially, shchorim. Black, blacks. And that's what they call themselves as well. These guys call themselves Shchorim. So the first name of the section is Hamachlaka or Hamachlaka Shchora, or the, the black section. And because they're, of course, they're darker in their complexion than the Jews who come from, from Eastern Europe. And then, so in the first documents, you'll see that they call themselves, this is kind of what they call themselves, and that's what they're called. And then at some point, someone realizes that this is not okay. And they change the name of the section. So instead of shachor, black in Hebrew, someone just drops one letter and it becomes shachar, dawn. Shachor, shachar. And it becomes known as machleket hashachar, the, the dawn section. And that's its official name, the dawn section. And people forget that the root was in this kind of slur against the, the, the men of the section. But most of the time they call it the Arab section, machleka aravit, which has its own complexities. Who are these guys? I mean, are they pretending to be Arabs or are they actually Arabs? I mean, they're native Arabic speakers. They come from the Arab world. If you can have Arab Christians, can you have Arab Jews? So it, it touches on the very complicated identity that they have. And if you just discuss them as Israeli spies, you lose all of these layers of identity confusion that are in play in this story. These guys are basically Jewish refugees from Arab countries who pretend to be Arab refugees from a Jewish country. And there's so much going on in the, in the story that's, um, that's wonderful and interesting and also painful, if you're being honest. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and Matti, I actually think this painful history is a really important one for all of us to really engage with uh, and confront because it wasn't only the name of the Arab section. Uh, the, the discrimination against uh, Mizrahim or Jews from Arab lands really extended uh, from like a systematic structural space 
state-sponsored discrimination went on for decades, whether it was the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi Jews that came in the late 40s and 50s, uh, Moroccan and Algerian Jews, uh, they were, there's so many documentations. Uh, and now in Israel, documentaries, people are talking about this, uh, about the way that different, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of immigrants coming to Israel in the early decades of the state, and there was definite discrimination between, say, how Romanian immigrants were treated versus Moroccan immigrants. Uh, David Ben Gurion was actually quoted in, in um, Salah Pozer Israel, the documentary, as saying, Aita uh, Aflaya, there was discrimination, Vizot Aita Aflaya Mukhrechet, and it was an essential or necessary discrimination. Uh, so it's, it's very painful uh, to, to really read about this, but I think it's really essential, especially for all of us American Jews who, who we identify with Israel or with the Zionist project. Uh, and part of that identification is both to celebrate its gains, but also to recognize its flaws and to ask ourselves, what can we do right now uh, to help deal with this? Because not all of it uh, is gone. Uh, and Israel still has plenty of ways to go in order to address um, the ethnic uh, gap uh, between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim. I'll just name something. I, rem I remember a couple of years ago that I was about to fly to Israel for the summer. I tried to go every summer, and I had my little son with me uh, who was born recently before, before the flight, uh, and I was on a cab, on, the, on an Uber, on my way to the airport, and I was reading the news in Israel, and I started reading different documents about um, Yemenite children. For a very long time, there was like a certain, what was thought of as like a community myth by the Yemenites that their children had been kidnapped in a systematic way by the Ashkenazi government. It's a very complicated parasha and it's kind of unclear especially exactly what happened. There has been no evidence of like, a, of like a intentional kidnapping, but there's been plenty of evidence of almost criminal negligence in which parents weren't told what happened to their children, in which doctors weren't so careful about medicine they gave to the babies who had darker skin than the lighter skin babies. And it was really painful, you know, like driving to the airport, reading this, having my son with me, who, you know, we both have like darker skin, and thinking, what would have happened? And this was as, um, you know, decades ago. Uh, so, so there's something there that I think uh, is important for us to engage with uh, from a place of tikkun, from a place of asking constructively, what can we do? What can we do both to, to have integrity in the story that we tell ourselves and that we tell our communities? And also, what can we do uh, in terms of advancing elements in Israeli society that I can actually bring, uh, that can actually bring better relations and advancement of communities that have been marginalized. You write in the book beautifully about how Ben Gurion and the Zionist leaders, the founders, are trying to create one society, but it was really, in many ways, it was a um, what do you call it, tiered society. And I was just curious. Um, you live in Israel. You're here. Um, how is the Mizrahi community in Israel today um, dealing with this painful, complicated, um, uh, ugly part of Israel's past? I think it's, it's, the history is very much alive, um, and you can see it in voting patterns, you can see it in public discussions, you can see it in, the, in documentaries like the one that Michal mentioned, but I think it's important to, to say that there's no Mizrahi community. It's, that's a catch-all phrase for half of the Jewish citizens of Israel, doctors who came from Tunis and shepherds who came from Yemen, and it's just this vast thing. It's like saying Ashkenazim. What does the Ashkenazi community have to say about it? Well, Ashkenazi community is anyone from Vilna to Vancouver. That's a pretty big, uh, uh, you know, basket. Um, so it's all kinds of different people. Some of them are more traditional. Some of them are less. Some of them are very liberal. Some of them are, are, are not. But it definitely plays out in our voting patterns. For example, the base of the Likud party has always been heavy on Jews from the Middle East, uh, just to give you one, one example. And there are old reasons for that. And one of the reasons is that the humiliation that was dealt to these people in the early years of the state is not something that you easily forget. And the labor Zionist established which is so I'm not misconstrued, that Ben Gurion and these and his colleagues in the leadership were geniuses. They were geniuses, and as someone who lives in Israel, I owe them everything. And I think that their understanding of Jewish history is only proven more and more right as time goes on. So just so I'm not <laughs> misinterpreted here. They had blind spots, as we all do, and this was one of their big blind spots. And the humiliation that they dealt to people coming from the Middle East in particular isn't something you forget in a generation or two generations. People still remember it, and that's one of the main reasons that um, people who came from that background largely avoided voting for the Labour Party, even though, ironically, the head of the Labour Party right now 
is Moroccan, um, but not for long, uh, if you're uh, familiar with their showing in the recent election. And they won six seats out of 120. So it's, um, it's, it's very much alive. But when I chose this topic for the book, I was choosing it on purpose. I wanted to tell a story about Jews from the Middle East, but I didn't want it to be a story about victims or people who are only victims. And you can tell stories about victimization, and, and, and they're true. Stories of the Ma'abarot, these very kind of impoverished immigration camps, and the stories about just the disdain with which this culture was treated, and the disdain for religion, and this kind of expectation that everyone was going to be a secular socialist, and which made sense at the time, and, and has kind of uh, doesn't make sense from 2019. But these guys were not victims. They were actors in the story, and they came from these places, and they're place in their society was complicated and uncomfortable, but they fought for the creation of the state. They put their lives on the line for the, for the creation of the state, which they understood was necessary. They understood, I think, better than the European Jews what was going to be required to get it, because they were from the Islamic world. They understood what this meant, and they, and, and they did it. And not only that, their Arab identities, precisely the aspect of their identity that was not welcome in official Israel in the early years of the state, that identity is their weapon in the service of the state. It's not that they just join the Palmach and go off to fight. They take their Arabic, and they take Aleppo, and they bring Damascus, and that's what they use to create the state. And that makes them very interesting, and it also makes them part of the story, because we're looking at Israel in 2019. What we have is a country that has been created in equal parts by Jews from Europe and Jews from the Middle East. And because we're in the Middle East and we're kind of shaped by our um, contact with the Islamic world, I think the Middle Eastern component of our society is the dominant component. And I think we need to kind of address them as, as actors and not as victims of someone as someone else, uh, or not just as, as victims. And I think that if we, we, we still tell a story as if Israel is a story of the Jews of Europe, and Jews came from the Middle East and joined the story of the Jews of Europe. That's basically how we think about it. Even people in Israel think of it that way. Israel is a story of European Zionism, and Jews come from Yemen or Morocco, or and they join the story. They join, Middle Eastern Jews join the story of the Jews of Europe. But if you really think about it, what happened was that the remnant of European Jewry goes to the Middle East and joins the story of the Jews of the Middle East. That's what happened. It's the opposite. So if you think of it that way, then the... The question of who's the actor in the story and who is not or who's central and who's not gets a bit muddied in a way that I think is positive. Yeah, I think part of the challenge is that there is so little awareness about uh, Mizrahim or like the Middle Eastern parts uh, of Israel that Westerners, we've created these monolithic portrayals. So the way that I usually see Mizrahim spoken about are in very political partisan context, almost as like a, a weapon to try to win political points about Israel. So for example, I've heard uh, plenty of uh, people who identify as post-Zionist or anti-Zionist, and they point to the discrimination of the Mizrahim, and they say, hey, you see here who the Zionists were? And they say that the, 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 the Zionist European Jews uh, went and they destroyed a beautiful, harmonious union between Arab and Jews, and they completely destroyed that entire culture. That, of course, is a caricature, it's a monolithic. Uh, most Mizrahi Jews today most identify as, as, as a, a Zionist uh, in Israel. Uh, they tend to be more nationalistic than, say, you know, your regular uh, Ashkenazi uh, Jews. Uh, and most of them don't speak of the European Zionists as having come and torn them uh, from an Arab world that, especially after 48, became incredibly hostile towards them. So that's one way in which I, I really believe that uh, the story of Mizrahim is, is weaponized and really used uh, in, in very monolithic and flat ways uh, in the different uh, political wars that are happening uh, over Israel. So I think it's really important to tell the, the human story, like you're saying, a complicated story filled with grays in which agency is complicated, in which you have both discrimination, but also Israel was a, a place of refuge that, you know, without having such little resources, you just started a state, and you take in hundreds of thousands of Jews who have nowhere to go. That's incredible. So there's so much gray and so much complexity in the story, and I think it's really important for us to really uh, bring it to the fore and talk about it beyond the, you know, fighting over narratives. Let me just ask you one last thing about this, um, which is, how much is your book and your writing in general um, fighting the narrative of Israel as this European uh, colonial state? Well, I'm not really engaged in a narrative battle. This isn't a PR uh, broadside or something like that. I I'm trying to understand Israel mostly for myself. 
<laughs> as someone who came with a very simple idea. And I came to Israel in 1995, as I mentioned, and what I knew was the kibbutz movement. And very quickly, I found myself in an Israeli army outpost in Lebanon. And I wrote a book about that, too. And I was in this foreign country called Lebanon. And our allies were Arabic-speaking Christians. And we were fighting Shia Muslims. And what did this have to do with uh, Alif Talid Gordon and the kibbutz movement? I couldn't, you know. So since 1995, I've been trying to figure out this country where I've inserted myself and where I've you know, lived for most of my life and where I'm raising kids. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I've concluded that the most important thing for, for Israelis, too, but for, definitely for an English-speaking audience, to understand is this. This is the, the most important missing piece in, in the story. And we need to understand it, first of all, so that we can understand ourselves better. That's a worthwhile pursuit. Uh, having said that, um, there's no doubt that one of the ways Israel is attacked now is using that line of assault, which is that Israel is a white colonialist entity that was imposed on the Arab Middle East as a result of things that happened in Europe. And that only works as long as you're ignorant of this history. Um, you know, there's a, I don't know if you've ever been to Cairo. But there's an amazing uh, mural in Cairo that commemorates the greatest moment in Egyptian military history, which is the crossing of the Suez Canal in 1973, when they sur surprise the Israelis on Yom Kippur, and they surge across the canal. And there's this great, weird, like, socialist realism mural in Cairo that commemorates it. And you see heroic Egyptians, you know, crossing the canal, and Israeli soldiers raising their hands, they're in humiliating poses, they're going like this, and they're begging for their, for their lives, and the Israeli soldiers are all blonde. And if you've ever seen an Israeli army unit, you know that Israeli soldiers are not, in fact, blunt. Um, in fact, they look kind of like Egyptians. And, but you, uh, and some of them, some of the Israeli soldiers on Suez in 73 were Egyptians. Right? There were 80,000 Jews in, Europe, in, in Egypt, and um, many of them came to Israel. So if you're the Arab world, if you're an Arab state trying to erase what happened to your own Jewish population, it makes sense to portray Israelis as blonde. Because if they're blonde, then no one asks why there's a huge swath of downtown Cairo that's called Harat el Yahud, the Jewish quarter, that's empty of Jews. And what, where's, what happened to the Jews in the Jewish quarter in Casablanca? And what happened to the one-third of residents of Baghdad in the 40s who were Jews? What happened to them? So those are uncomfortable questions for the Arab world, and it all goes away if you pretend that the Israelis are blonde. And that has been done very effectively. And it's still done for Western audiences who are ignorant of this, of this history. And I think that we have to acknowledge that part of the success of this narrative is, is our own fault, because we always wanted to be blonde. Well, oh, not all of us. Just not all of us, not Michal. But the Zionist movement, <laughs> the, Zionist, the Zionist movement, a big part of it was an attempt to become European. Jews had been tarred in Europe for centuries as Oriental others. And we wanted to join the family of nations, which meant in the 20s and 30s and 40s becoming European. So the, in the early uh, propaganda photos of you know, Halutzim, you would see that it's a guy without a shirt who's a bit blonde or light in complexion, and he's hoeing the fields in the day and listening to Beethoven at night. And this was a part of the, the idea, and it was a very European idea. So in a weird way, we were happy with that portrayal. So the Arab world has this uh, narrative that it's pushing, and it's been accepted by kind of left intellectuals who like that narrative. Um, and Israel, in a weird way, has kind of also been suggesting that it's a European country and thinking of itself in that way. And that has obscured the fact that if you stand on a street in Israel and look at the people, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Israelis aren't um, that. So if we understand that Israel makes more sense, and it also um, undermines what is currently a fashionable line of attack against the country, which is the one that you mentioned. So Michal, um, I want to ask you, um, the uh, Sephardic community tends to be a little more traditional. And once I say tends to be a little more traditional, I know we can blow that apart. Um, but my question for you is, um, you're, um, you're an outspoken new voice, a spiritual leader. Um, how does, how does um, the, um, I guess, how are, um, how are you being received by members um, of your larger community, which is also our community. I feel like I'm putting my foot in my mouth. But what I mean here is just in terms of your, in, uh, in terms of the uh, Sephardic world, you're, um, you're, you're really, I mean, something of a, um, what's, what do you call it, pioneer? Um, yes, yeah, so, so a, a lot of things come up when you ask the question. First of all, to say that uh, the same as, you know, the Mizrahim are not a monolithic, neither is the Sephardic world. Uh, and there are Sephardic individuals and Sephardic communities, and each of them have their own flavors, musics, uh, and different characters. 
Uh, as a general rule, and I'm going to speak about the American context, I would say that uh, many of the Sephardi communities that function as communities, like living close together geographically, uh, today in America are communities that actually came from the Islamic world. Uh, and many of them, I think you could comfortably characterize them uh, as being more traditional or more socially conservative, uh, or whatever term uh, we, wanna, we wanna use here. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, I'm very grateful uh, to, to have come from a Sephardi community and to continue belonging to one. Uh, my husband was born and raised in the Syrian Sephardi community in Brooklyn, and you know, it, it's part of, a, uh, of our family narrative uh, that, that we belong to such a, a beautiful community. Um, and at the same time, uh, I do a lot of my activities also outside the community. Uh, I, I work at the Shalom Hartman Institute, which is a liberal, pluralistic uh, think tank and research center. Uh, and I also uh, started uh, a Minyan uh, uh, community, uh, a prayer community. Uh, and those are things that aren't always, um, you know, that not everybody from, from, from the Sephardi community uh, would do. Uh, I would say that, uh, thank God, it's been, um, I've been able to, to live uh, in multiple communities at the same time. Um, and to actually find that there's tremendous diversity under the surface when you seek them. Uh, to be able to have um, amazing intellectual conversations uh, with friends from, from all communities. But I actually want to address two things related to your question. One of the things is the following. Sometimes I'm asked, uh, you know, do you identify, you know, they ask me as a progressive woman or as a feminist, uh, what do you think about, you know, the Sephardi community or women in the Sephardi community or questions like that? And one of the things that's incredibly important for me to stress time and again is that I reject um, the Western attempt to look at non-Western communities only through Western lenses. I'm not going to come with a Western feminist uh, uh, metric and use that in order to judge communities that come from a completely different context and have a very different moral point of view uh, of looking at the world. So that's really important for me to name, even as I have myself personally adopted some of the more progressive uh, feminist discourses, which I'm comfortable with as long as I don't represent it as something fully representative <laughs> of all uh, Sephardim or, or Mizrahi Jews uh, out there. So that's an important point to make. Uh, the second important point that I want to make here is the following. Um, I often get phone calls uh, to speak at different events. Uh, sometimes they tell me, oh, you did research on Sephardic Jews. I said, yes, I did. I'm happy to talk about that. And sometimes they'll tell me, oh, we heard you're Sephardic. Can you please come and talk? Uh, which is a very funny way to invite somebody to come talk in a panel, right? Uh, so, of course, you know, I try to tell them it's not nice to tokenize anyone. Um, but, but in addition to that, I always wonder, are they calling me because I am a Sephardic woman who knows how to talk to a liberal crowd and can talk liberal values? What does that mean about the conception of diversity that we have in our community if diversity becomes skin deep? That it's enough for someone to, I don't know if it's the accent or have a slightly different shade of color skin or, you know, like, you know, as long as you have that diversity, uh, you don't need to have a moral, political, or ideological diversity, which is an incredible layer of diversity when actually talking about different communities. So if there's one thing that's important for me to emphasize when talking about the Sephardic world and representation, is that if we really want to have diversity, then we need to ask ourselves some pretty big questions. We need to ask ourselves, how can we make sure that our diversity is not shallow, that it's deep, and that we're willing to bring in voices and ideas that perhaps don't fit in so neatly with ours and that may, might make us a little bit uncomfortable. So that's a question that I think the American Jewish community really needs to confront and to engage with. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie's confronting it right now. Yeah, I'm confronting it right now. So um, we would like to uh, thank the two of you and we would like to open it up for questions. Hi. Uh, thank you for, for talking. I sort of have two questions and I was sort of curious about them. The first is how do you address sort of the Naim Giladi sort of perspective that Zionism in the Arab world was mainly an imposition from uh, Israel and, and the Ashkenazi elites in Israel creating and instigating events in the Arab world? How do you sort of respond to that? Because that's the contra-dialogue to yours. And the second one is I'm sort of curious 
as to why the Mizrahi communities in Israel that are religious have begun to assimilate European ways of dress and behavior. For example, if we look at Bukharian communities that lived in, uh, in Uzbekistan, they had wonderful, colorful robes, and now they're dressed in the European litvak style. So I was just curious if you could address these sorts of uh, questions. Uh, so, so yeah, so the first question, I mean, a lot of it depends on how you understand questions around agency. Like, do we really believe that, like, you know, European uh, Ashkenazi Zionists can uh, convince and manipulate all these hundreds of thousands of Jews who then have no agency or no mind to actually think about what they're doing and, and where they're going? Uh, I'll tell you that I see a similar argument made about anti-Semitism in the Arab world after 1948. People will tell me, oh, you know, it wasn't really their fault. It was, you know, the, the white colonialists that, con you know, brought in anti-Semitism and it was only a, a response to Zionism. So, I mean, it doesn't matter so much to me what instigated. My, my, my husband's parents had to flee Egypt uh, from Nasser and there was anti-Semitism in the Arab world. And I really believe in agency and in, and in people taking responsibility um, for their actions. So that's the first question. Uh, the second question, so there's been a, fa we haven't spoken about Shas or about Haredim Sephardim in Israel and they're really important uh, community or phenomenon to follow, they managed to retain their electoral votes uh, in this prior, past election, which other you know, Mizrahi politicians like Kahlon couldn't really uh, do. Uh, and um, it's, a, it's a much longer conversation. I recommend the works of Nisim Leon, uh, who did a lot of work around uh, Shaz and Haredi uh, I'll say that part of it was really, um, part of it was that there was a, an attempt to assimilate to the elite uh, Ashkenazi Haredi world. And part of it was by adopting different uh, modes of clothing. Uh, I think Rav Ovadia, uh, of blessed memory wa was also uh, an instrumental part of this. Uh, he wanted to really bring back pride to the Sephardic communities, to return the crown to its former glory. And the way that he did it, and in a brilliant way, was to borrow certain things from the Ashkenazim, but at the same time to maintain that there's something that Sephardi Jews have to be proud of. So I think it's a really complicated conversation. And I'll say one last thing. It's not only in Israel. Uh, in America, it's happening uh, as well. Uh, and I think it's something that we should keep thinking about. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. The question is about the, the, the discrimination against, or if the discrimination against Jews from the uh, Islamic world has, has changed and has got better, and, and have, have the gaps narrowed, and what about the Ethiopian community in Israel? That's uh, how I understood the question. The, the gaps have narrowed, if you look at the numbers, and if you look at the political system, for example, once you know, the political system in the higher echelons was almost entirely Ashkenazi, and now if you look at the politicians, we, we've never had a prime minister of Middle Eastern descent, which is interesting and kind of telling. But in the upper echelons of the political system, you'll see a lot of people who have roots in the Islamic world, the head of the Labour Party, which is very interesting. Um, the culture minister, Miri Regev, is from North Africa, or North African descent. Um, the justice minister, the outgoing justice minister, Ayelet Chaked, is, I think, half Iraqi, if I'm getting that uh, right. And of course, the finance minister, Moshe Kahlon, is from a Libyan family. So this is, this is changing. It is changing, but the gaps have not disappeared. And if you look at, you know, you don't even have to look at the numbers. The numbers show that you're much more likely to be unemployed and poor if you come from a Middle Eastern background than if you come from a European background. But if you just go to a welfare bureau in any Israeli city, or if you go to a place like Netivot, which is kind of a poor city, you'll see that it's almost, it's, it's solidly Mizrahi. And if you go to a university sociology department, you'll see that it's most likely um, Ashkenazi. So the gaps still exist. So if people say, oh, this was just in the past, this was in the 50s, and it's been sorted out, that's not true. And if you, and, and seeing things that way, will kind of obscure a lot of what's going on in Israel, which is still a, a battle about, about that, and about what Israel is and what it's supposed to be. Many of Israel's founders believed that what was being created was a kind of Vienna in the Middle East. That's definitely what Theodor Herzl thought he was doing. Uh, many people thought they were kind of forming a, a, a socialist republic almost on Soviet uh, on the Soviet model, but but that happened to be in, in the land of Israel. And there's a lot of resentment of the fact that what has emerged in Israel is something that is a lot less like Warsaw than it is like Alexandria. What's, what's, what we have is a kind of Alexandria or Beirut, or rather what Alexandria and Beirut should have been. Right, a city on the Mediterranean with a, you know, with sunshine and a kind of Middle Eastern attitude and Middle Eastern religion and a different. And it's not socialist, right? And it's not ascetic. It's something completely different. It's very Levantine, and a lot of the arguments that seem to be about left and right in Israel are actually about that. It's actually a cultural 
argument about what the country is, is supposed to be. So you need to be aware of that in order to understand what Israelis are talking about a lot of the time. The Ethiopians would be a longer uh, discussion. They have their own set of complaints, ju justified complaints, and their own kind of discrimination as the latest wave of immigrants who, who came, and, and they're dealing with a lot of things that I think racism that Mizrahim had to deal with it, you know, two or three generations ago, and that is a big and also important uh, story, but because the Ethiopians are a relatively small number, it, if you're trying to wrap your head around one thing uh, this evening, let's leave it uh, with the Jews of the Middle East. <laughs> if I can discuss the book for a moment. Uh, given the success of Eli Cohen, came from that area of the world, uh, how do you feel the Israelis as a whole will evaluate the creative methods that uh, Mossad and uh, other organizations have used in order to protect the state of Israel, based it, on your book? It, it's interesting that you mentioned Eli Cohen. Eli Cohen, who I'm, I think is a name that's familiar to, to many of you, was Israel's Oh, sure. The question is about um, um, the, the success of, Israel, of Israeli intelligence, basically, and its connection to the story of the Arab section. The Arab section is one of the seeds of what becomes the Mossad. It's almost incredibly um, amateurish if you have this mystique of Israeli intelligence in your mind. These guys didn't make salaries. They did not own a camera. So they would go out on, on missions, and they had to borrow a camera from a civilian who, who they knew who had a Minox camera, and two of these guys are told to go take pictures on the Syrian border, and if they don't come back, that's okay, but the camera better come back, because they borrowed it. Um, they go off to Lebanon in the, at the height of the independence war without a radio. They have no way to communicate. So when the state is founded, they have no idea. They, did, they didn't know, you know, 71 years ago this week, when Israel is founded, they're in Beirut running this intelligence operation that has no way to communicate with headquarters, and they are reading Arabic newspapers that say that the state has been destroyed in the Arab invasion. So it's incredibly low tech. There are about a dozen guys. They've been poorly trained. Half of them, half of the agents who are active in the section at the beginning of the war are caught and executed, in, in large part because they don't really know what they're doing. And a, a misconjugated verb can get you killed. A Muslim ritual that you don't do exactly right can get you killed and does. Uh, an item of dress that you know, spark suspicion can get you killed, and, and this all happens. So this is all very low tech, and yet against incredible odds, at this incredibly dangerous moment, these guys set off to found a state, and they do whatever is necessary, and, and it works. And in 1950, they're extracted from Beirut in a rubber dinghy, and they're brought back to the state of Israel, where they've never been, because when they left, it was April 1948, disguised as Palestinian refugees. There was no state. When they come back in 1950, it's the first time they've ever been in the state. And they, uh, most of them, the surviving members, go on to serve in the Mossad. Gamliel Jamil is undercover um, in Europe for more than a decade as an Arab journalist. His family is part of the cover story. His wife, who I met, uh, told me that when she gave birth in Europe, uh, in the 1950s under a cover identity, one of the things she had to remember was not to scream in Hebrew. Um, he has a daughter uh, whose name is Mira, uh, who was born with the name Samira, which is an Arab name. She was given an Arab name that could be easily changed to a Hebrew name once they came back to Israel. So she's born Samira, and, now she, and then they came back when she was a few years old. She didn't know she was Jewish, and she came back to Israel and became Mira. So he was an important agent. Yakub Akon has a very famous career in the Mossad. Um, Sam'an, who is an Iraqi Jew who runs the Arab section, it's really his brainchild. He's the father of the, uh, of the idea in Israeli intelligence that Jews from Arab countries can become like Arabs, an idea in Hebrew that's called histarvut, mistarvim, ones who become like Arabs. It's a, an idea that I discuss in the book, and if you've seen Fauda, as I'm sure some of you have, then you know what I'm talking about. Sam'an goes on to be, become one of the most important spy masters in Israeli intelligence, and he runs Eli Cohen. So there's a direct line between the Arab section and the success of Israeli intelligence. Eli Cohen penetrates the highest levels of the Syrian regime under the identity Kamal Amin Thabit, and he's a much more sophisticated version of of these guys who are something very, very early, very unformed, but one of the necessary, necessary steps from the chaos of the Palmach to the creation of a real intelligence service. So before we end, um, I wanna ask you one last question. One of the things that we were involved here in New York is a conversation about um, sculptures and, um, and uh, personalities that should be featured who we don't know about. So if you were going to put a sculpture up in Jerusalem or the middle of Haifa or, I don't know, Tel Aviv um, or any Jewish day school here in anywhere in the world. Can you give us each 
one name of a Mizrahi or Sephardi leader, man, woman, it doesn't really matter. It's just that we leave here with the name of someone that we can go home and Google. Uh, I, I'll just, I've been really inspired uh, in conversations with a philosopher whose name is Mayor Buzaglo. Uh, he's still very much alive, so I wouldn't put a sculpture of him anywhere. It's like weird. Um, but We could ask him to stand really still. Yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, no, he's the son of a famous uh, Paitan, Chazan, uh, uh, David Buzaglo f from Morocco. Uh, and what I found so amazing about him, he's a professor of mathematics in Hebrew U, and he also founded a movement called Tikkun. Tikkun means like repair, like fixing. Uh, which tries to, to bridge between different elements of Jewish society and to bridge between the Arab and Jewish part of, of the legacy of, of Mizrahim. Uh, and he was the man I went to when I landed in Israel when I read that uh, the Yemenite children's story and I was like heartbroken. <laughs> and I was like, I need to speak to someone to help me debrief and try to grapple with this. And it was amazing speaking to him because he spoke from a place of so much love and so much hope and so much constructive looking forward, and he told me, you have to come from a place of wanting to, you know, to, to, to fix society and to do a tikkun and to do something really good. Uh, and he left me with a lot of hope that we can both maintain our stories from the past and also look towards the future uh, and not compromise uh, on either of them. Um, I would, um, uh, of course, being a journalist, I can't just give you one answer to a question like that. I have a, I have a few, I would, um, uh, you know, there are great figures of Middle Eastern Judaism, people like Saad Yagon, you know, I mean, incredible minds. Um, uh, Musa ibn Maimon, if you know him, Maimonides, Moshe ibn Maimon, that was his Arabic name. Um, uh, Shalom Shabazi, the great uh, Yemeni uh, poet. Um, and if we needed a modern hero, then I might go for our friend Kamal Amin Thabet, Eli Cohen, who is a Syrian Jew raised in Egypt, who comes to join the Zionist movement and uses his Arabness as as a weapon in the, you know, in the, in the cause and pays the ultimate price for it. And because he doesn't have a grave, we don't know where he's buried, it might actually be nice to have a statue of Eli Cohen somewhere. Yeah, and I, I want to make sure we don't leave without knowing that Sephardi and Mizrahi women exist also. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, if we're looking at historical figures, uh, Gracia Hannah Mendes, uh, an amazing woman who... Uh, don't know Gracia. Uh, yeah, I lived in the time of the, of the Inquisition and really uh, paved the road to save the, the lives of, uh, of thousands of Jews. And eventually her nephew established a settlement uh, in, in, uh, yeah, in Tiberias. Uh, or Adi Kaysar, a modern-day poetess in Israel who does something called Ars Poetica. Uh, there's amazing, amazing uh, uh, people to look at. Also amazing TV shows, besides for Shtisel, which you know, we can talk about later. <laughs> Uh, there's uh, Zugari, uh, Imperia, there's Shababnikim that has really fascinating dynamics between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim in the, in the show, uh, and many other amazing ways to engage with this. So the other thing, one last thing, is that the most popular is music in Israel right now, according to your book, but also from my recent visits, is Mizrahi music. So even if you don't know Hebrew, just Google popular uh, Israeli music today, and the tunes that you'll hear are the tunes that the soldiers um, might have actually heard many years ago. Um, your book is on sale in the back. You'll be signing it in the vestibule. We cannot thank you enough for coming here tonight. We cannot thank you. Uh, thank, thank, you. you. thank you so much for having me. And um, we wish everyone a wonderful night. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.